Hello, everyone, and welcome to the COVID-19 and Health Inequity Seminar Series presented to you by the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics in the Harvard P.H. Chan School of Public Health. This is the second talk of a five-part series running through October 27th, 22nd. I am your moderator, Tiffany Lemon, and today we are excited to welcome Dr. Jarvis Chen from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Let's get started by covering a few logistics. This seminar is being recorded, so please turn off your camera if you do not wish to be recorded. The recording will be available on our website at a later point in time. At 2.45, we'll stop for questions. Throughout the talk, you can send your questions via the chat function to Emma Okorsi. In advance, we apologize for technical difficulties. During the presentation, you will see um, a toolbar. All right, let's get started. We are thrilled to have Dr. Chen with us today. Dr. Chen is a social epidemiologist whose research focuses on social inequities in health, especially racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic disparities in cancer outcome. As a methodologist, Dr. Chen's interests include the development of methods for geospatial and spatiotemporal analysis, disease mapping, handling missing data, and latent variable analysis. All right, let's go. Dr. Chen, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you for everyone who's, uh, who's joining us today. Um, I'm really appreciative of this opportunity to share um, some of the research that we've been doing on COVID-19 disparities in the United States. Um, I'm just gonna get right into it um, and give you uh, an overview. Just I'm gonna talk about four interconnected projects um, that we've been working on since the beginning um, of the pandemic in the United States. Um, one related to looking at disparities by county and zip code um, social metrics. Um, a second analysis looking at trends in excess mortality in Massachusetts specifically. Uh, some work that we've done with colleagues on racial ethnic disparities, especially age specific analyses. Um, and then some of our uh, ongoing recent work looking at how these inequities have been evolving over time um, in the United States. <clears throat> so first of all, um, just to say that like many of you, I'm sure in the audience, like many of my colleagues, um, we were struck in the beginning of the spring as we started to uh, learn about COVID-19 and about uh, facing the reality of this pandemic situation that we find ourselves in um, about the need for there to be good data as with any public health um, situation, but some, certainly something as urgent and as pressing as a public health emergency like uh, a pandemic disease, just the need for there to be good surveillance data and uh, to, in order to document who is affected, um, in order for that to work well, the data have to be timely um, and they have to be in a form that can really inform policy and interventions and assure accountability. And with Hi, respect Jarvis. to COVID, yes. One second, could you share your screen? I think your oh. screen's not being shared. Perfect. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks. All right. so I've been having lots of technical difficulties today, and so, but that was an easy one that we should have been able to fix. Okay, so, um, in the case of COVID-19, we're particularly concerned with who's at risk of being infected, who's at risk of developing a severe disease or severe outcomes, who's most at risk of dying. Um, related to this is of course, who's getting tested. We all know the um, inconsistencies and in the availability of testing in the United States. Um, and fundamentally the question of how are testing and resources being distributed to the communities who need them the most. And Ample research on social determinants of health in the United States would lead us to anticipate that there would be inequalities that would be exacerbated um, by pandemic disease in terms of who's able to practice social distancing, in terms of who can afford to work from home, 
versus who is considered an essential worker, who has access to protect personal protective equipment, what are the conditions in which people live, um, especially um, who is able to isolate in order to protect others in their household, um, the issue of who is able to take sick time off from work if they were to get infected um, or to be exposed, um, who has comorbidities that increase the risk of severe illness and death, who has access to health care, and this question of what communities, uh, what is the infrastructure in communities and, and how healthcare uh, infrastructure could be overwhelmed um, by cases needing hospitalization. And all of these things point back to the urgency of having data that are able to document um, COVID-19 disparities in real time. All right, sorry, I'm having trouble advancing my screen. There we go. All right, so early on, um, what we were dismayed to see is that uh, the data that were really available um, were only available for total confirmed cases and deaths um, on an ongoing basis, and usually at a very large level of geographic aggregation in terms of states and counties. Um, even though local, and local health departments were reporting data, um, the consistency of those data were really spotty. Um, in general, those data lacked information on age, which means we couldn't do age adjustment or standardization. Very early on, data were not available on the race ethnicity, particularly of cases. And in fact, that continues to be the case that many state and local health departments have large number of unknown race ethnicity in their reported confirmed case data. Um, the total lack of data on socioeconomic position also precluded any documentation of socioeconomic inequalities in COVID-19 outcomes. And also the lack of small area level data precluded looking at particular communities who might be severely burdened. Even as race ethnicity has started to become available, it, as I mentioned, it's still missing for a large proportion of cases and deaths. Uh, the data are not presented stratified by age. And even though education and occupation are part of the US standard death certificate, those data are not reported um, in any of the publicly available data sets that we've seen. So this issue of overcoming the absence of socioeconomic data in public health surveillance data sets is actually something that our research group led by Nancy Krieger in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences has been leading on for over 20 years. So we had the Public Health Disparities Geocoding Project, um, which Dr. Krieger initiated um, 20 years ago, was in fact to address this very issue by using this methodology of geocoding uh, information in the surveillance data set on the address of residents, and then being able to link records as well as population at risk to the socioeconomic characteristics of the areas where people live. And so we've investigated this um, over many years and applied these techniques to a wide range of health outcomes. These techniques have been widely adopted um, in academia and also um, in public health. And so we thought that this is an important uh, set of techniques that could be used to shed some light on the socioeconomic disparities in COVID-19 outcomes. So way back in April, um, early on when we were all at home and trying to think about how we could be useful and contribute to the research. Uh, we started this project to use data from one of the publicly um, available sources reporting daily COVID uh, deaths as well as uh, cases um, and to link those to county level social, social metrics that I'll talk about in just a second. We also wanted to see whether we could get better resolution data by looking at the zip code as a unit of analysis. And so we also pulled some data from the Illinois uh, Department of Public Health at the time, uh, along with the Chicago Reporter, uh, which is a, a, a um, journalistic site, they had produced a website that enabled us to download information on the zip codes of confirmed cases. And similarly, New York at the time, New York City, was reporting data on positive tests. So we downloaded data from these three sources. Um, we used the USA Fax data set because um, there were a few choices at the time um, in terms of the Hopkins um, 
CSSE data as well as the New York Times data. But one thing we noticed was that many data sources were reporting New York City as one unit, when in fact the boroughs of New York City, each of the five boroughs is a county and the counties are quite different in their characteristics. So USA Facts was actually the source that we found that had the data on the five different boroughs and that we could analyze. Um, and an interesting thing that was brought to my attention recently is that if you go to the CDC um, website, their COVID case tracker actually is just USA Facts data. So they actually use this data as well um, as their source for cases, for cumulative case counts. So we link to these data to what we call social metric data derived from the American Community Survey um, using the five-year estimates. And the variables that we chose to look at were uh, the percent living below the poverty line, the percent crowding, um, which is defined as more than one person per room um, in a household, and that's not including the, um, the the, not including the bathroom, I think it does include the kitchen we discovered. Um, so you actually have to be pretty crowded to qualify as crowded in terms of the number of people in a household. We also looked at some racial composition data, racial ethnic composition, and we settled on the percent population of color um, in a county, um, and also a measure called the index of concentration at the extremes. Um, which we applied specifically to racialized economic segregation. So we defined this in relation to, um, for this particular analysis, for uh, comparing the white high income population in an area to the black low income population in the area. Um, and for this analysis, since we were being descriptive, we defined some cut points and able to look at the distribution of the areas um, and I'll be able to characterize differences in rates by these categories. And then we connected all of these things to population denominators. Um, initially, we looked at American Community Survey um, derived population denominators, although for the county analysis, we actually ended up using US Census uh, county projections um, for intercensal years. And so this was way back in April, our initial look at this, which we published as a working paper on the Harvard Center for Population Development Studies working paper series, which showed um, in terms of the death data by county, market inequalities, particularly the highest um, death rates from COVID-19 being observed in the counties with the highest poverty. So here, um, the 20% poverty category and above. Um, in counties with the greatest amount of crowding, here 4.9% or more of the population in the county living in crowded conditions. And here in terms of the population of color, 61% um, of the population color or above um, having the highest rates uh, of COVID-19 deaths. Now we subsequently um, continued to update these data so that they were based uh, as, as the data continued to roll in. So here are the, the similar plots looking um, for May the 5th, um, where we saw the persistence of these patterns in terms of uh, poverty, crowding, and population percent population of color. Um, what we've done on the, the y-axis is re-express these things as actual rates rather than cumulative incidence proportions because we realized that as the epidemic progressed the cumulative proportion would tend to go up um, uh, with increased person time under observation whereas um, an actual rate takes into account the amount of person time under observation so we recalculated these into rates but the key thing is to see those gradients um, particularly clear for crowding and population of color, but a more complicated story comes out in relation to poverty. Whereas um, while the rates are highest in the uh, counties with the highest poverty, we also see that actually the rates are uh, lowest in these middle counties. And there are counties that have very low poverty that actually had not insubstantial rates. And we think that this has a lot to do with actually the particular states that were affected early on in the spring in terms of being in the Northeast, um, particularly in New York and New Jersey, Long Island, um, but also Massachusetts. 
Uh, and that's why we see this interesting U-shaped pattern in regard to the index of concentration at the extremes, where the highest rates were seen in the most disadvantaged areas. In other words, areas with the highest uh, population, uh, black population in low income categories, but that we also saw very similarly high rates in areas that were dominated by white populations in high income categories. And this is the, a pattern that we see um, with respect to the index of concentration at the extremes. Um, what was notable in this analysis overall is that if you compare the top to the bottom in terms of the most advantage to the most disadvantage, with respect to a measure like um, percent population of color, we see an incidence rate ratio that's as big as five, which is huge. Um, in terms of incidence rate ratios. We also looked at this, as I mentioned, for smaller um, geographic aggregations in terms of zip codes in Illinois. And in this situation, we see across all of our different measures, a much more kind of monotonic gradient in the direction that we would, um, we would anticipate. And we think this has a lot to do with the fact that counties are very uh, can be very heterogeneous in terms of the populations living there, whereas zip codes being relatively smaller than counties, um, you have a much sort of more homogeneity within the zip code in terms of the socioeconomic circumstances um, that people are living in. So we get a stronger signal with respect to the zip code level measures. Similarly, for the population of color uh, variable, we're seeing in the, the um, zip codes with the greatest concentration of people of color, a uh, uh, rate that is five times larger, a mortality rate that's five times larger than in the most uh, white um, areas. Um, and this pattern is also borne out in New York City in the testing data, um, where we see similar um, gradients, although there's some clustering that's going on with sort of similar rates being seen um, for multiple categories of the index of concentration at the extremes and also um, for the poverty variable. Uh, and I think this also reflects the, the reality that within cities, uh, cities like New York especially, when there was a lot of community transmission going on, um, that even across different types of zip codes, a lot of people were being affected. So you can see that also in the fact that these gradients um, within New York are much less steep than they were comparing across Illinois or comparing across all of the counties in the United States. Um, an important uh, limitation of these early analyses that we did, as I mentioned, is that age is not recorded in the USA FACTS data set and in fact continues to be inconsistently reported um, across many states and localities. And so it's not possible to do direct age standardization to take into account differences in the age distribution across counties, for example. Um, and we could anticipate this being important because um, age, the age distribution may be shifted towards younger ages in counties with large non-white racial ethnic populations or in counties with high poverty. And if this is the case, then the socioeconomic disparities that we've noted might be underestimated. There is an alternative to direct standardization, which is indirect standardization. And one advantage of this is that it doesn't require the age specific death counts at the county level, um, so long as the population denominators are available stratified by age. And then along with a set of age specific reference rates for the total population. So um, in the, during the summer, the CDC started to make available through the NCHS provisional COVID-19 death counts by sex and age and state, um, which makes it possible to do indirect standardization. And so we took a look to see what happens if you use indirect standardization um, to these socioeconomic gradients that we detected. Um, and so what you can see here on the left are the crude um, uh, rate ratios for COVID-19 mortality by the poverty, crowding, and percent population of color metrics. Uh, and on the right hand, you see what happens when you age standardize. 
Now, what happens for poverty is actually not much happens to the gradients that we detected for mortality. This is as of June 13th, so a little after our original May 5th um, date or May original May date. Um, but what you see for um, crowding is that the gradient gets a little bit steeper. Um, and for uh, percent population of color, the gradient does get steeper in terms of the um, disparities um, across these categories of uh, racial ethnic composition. So this supports the idea that failing to account for age does for some of our measures result in an understatement of, of how much disparity is actually there. Um, one of the caveats to remember about indirect standardized rate ratios is that they're only comparable to direct standardized rate ratios when the rate ratio is proportional across age. I mean, in this case, we standardize by sex as well. Um, so because we don't actually have the age and sex stratified death counts at the county level, we can't actually evaluate the validity of this assumption. However, given that in a moment, I'm going to show you some really dramatic um, differences in rate ratios by race ethnicity by age, um, it might be reasonable to expect this of socioeconomic disparities as well. And so we have to take the age standardized comparisons with a grain of salt and really um, insist on the need for health departments to release age stratified mortality counts at the county level, something that um, is still not happening. The CDC does now release um, age specific counts at the state level, um, but not at the county level, which is where we really want to be able to look at these county differences. All right, so I'm going to switch now and talk a little bit about our work looking at trends in excess mortality um, in Massachusetts and the disparities thereof. Um, and this came out of a realization that uh, especially early on, but I think still continuing to be the case that COVID-19 deaths being classified as a COVID-19 death is, is sensitive to inconsistencies in testing. So if you're not tested, but you die, you might not get recorded as a COVID-19 death, even if it actually was a COVID-19 death. And here's where the excess death framework gives us a way of quantifying the impact of COVID-19 on mortality. Uh, if we compare mortality in 2020 to what we would expect to see based on the 2015 to 2019 mortality data. Um, we were able to obtain data in Massachusetts on deaths from their fact of death filing. Um, we were able to obtain this with the assistance of some reporters at the Boston Globe who are really interested um, in this analysis and um, through the work of their lawyers were able to um, encourage the state to make these data available. What we ended up with were uh, death files that contained zip code and city town identifiers, as well as age, but did not include race, ethnicity, or education, even though those are part of the standard death certificate. What this enabled us to do then is to compute the age standardized mortality rates um, that I mentioned that we would like to be able to see because we do have age data. And so we did this stratified by zip code um, and in a parallel analysis, city town social metrics in order to investigate the social inequalities in the surge in excess mortality that happened um, in April and May. Uh, so again, the data came from these Massachusetts fact of death files. We linked them to American community survey data on uh, zip code and city town social metrics and also to denominators. Here we had to use the American Community Survey denominators because we were working at the small area level. We did translate these back into rates per 100,000 person years um, by multiplying the population counts by seven and dividing by the number of weeks in a year. Um, and we age standardized them to the year 2000 standard million. Um, and so just to say about excess deaths, these include the deaths that are presumably due to COVID-19, whether or not you were classified as a COVID-19 death, but they also include changes in the mortality patterns that may have occurred 
because especially during lockdowns earlier in the spring, people might have avoided seeking medical care for a heart attack or a stroke, or possibly if their comorbid condition was exacerbated by a coronavirus infection, um, or conversely, um, if due to re reductions in mortality, certain deaths didn't happen. Those would be kind of all together there in the excess death metric. Um, all right, so here we have on the left-hand side, the pattern of deaths by, in this case, poverty, um, based on the 2015 to 2019 data on the left, where you can see it's pretty flat, um, versus the surge that's really apparent happening starting at the end of March, continuing into April and into May um, in 2020. And what you can see with the different colored lines is that these were very socially patterned with the surges being largest in the zip codes that were of the highest poverty level. And in fact, at the peak, which happens here around April 15th, these uh, excess mortality rates are 1.14 times greater in the high poverty zip codes compared to the lowest poverty zip codes. If we look by crowding, that peak is 42% larger in the zip codes with the highest amount of crowding compared to those with the least amount of crowding. And if we look by uh, population of color, it's 78% greater um, in the zip codes with the highest population of color. So like 40, 43 to 97%. Um, and here by the index of concentration at the extremes, I've used the yellow to denote the areas that are uh, most disadvantaged. And in this case, our ICE measure was slightly different from before. We used white non-Hispanic high income versus all people of color low income, um, because in some analyses we had discovered that this was actually more sensitive to um, the, the social differences. Um, in the outcomes. So we can see, first of all, um, it's really striking to me that there was this surge and also that the surge abated um, into May. And so if you kind of think about when Massachusetts shut down back in March and then you allow for kind of four weeks between, you know, becoming a case and then dying, you can sort of see that this, this reduction in mortality is related to the steps that we took in Massachusetts to reduce um, you know, how people getting together and social contact, et cetera, implementing social distancing. But the fact that these, uh, that the surge was so much greater in the most disadvantaged zip codes is really alarming and points to how um, communities are being affected differentially. Um, all right, I'm gonna, move, I know this is a bit of a dizzying, array of things, but I kind of wanted to give you a feel of a bunch of the different things that we've been doing. So I'm moving now to a slightly different topic, which is to look at um, patterns in the racial ethnic disparities in COVID-19 mortality nationally, um, and looking at this in relation to age-specific analyses as well as age standardized. Um, and this is work that we did with Dr. Mary Bassett from the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. Um, and was inspired by uh, the observation that though people uh, back in May were talking about racial disparities, we didn't have a great handle on it. And at the time, the only data we really had to talk about was, was um, data on the crude um, rate ratios. And so at the time, I think several journalistic sources and blog posts had talked about this twofold excess risk being experienced in terms of COVID-19 deaths by non-Hispanic Blacks relative to non-Hispanic Whites. And if you look at the crude um, disparities, it's really only the non-Hispanic Black group that stands out. Um, all the other racial ethnic, non-white racial ethnic groups seem to have very similar rates to those being experienced by non-Hispanic Whites. But if you factor in to, um, the age distribution and the fact that um, uh, in many populations of color, the age distribution is skewed towards younger ages, a different story emerges. And so using data that became available in early May from um, NCHS, we were able to do age standardization. And when we do this, we find that that 
black-white disparity is more like 3.6 but that also disparities are seen for just about all the other racial ethnic groups, um, especially Hispanic Latino, um, but also Asian Pacific Islanders. Um, and here the point estimate is 1.2 for non-Hispanic American Indians or Alaskan Natives, um, but of course those numbers are much smaller. We also um, published this initial report of this um, in a working paper also on the POP Center website. When we break it down by age, however, some much more alarming patterns emerge. And so what we can see um, in this is that particularly below the age of 55, the uh, rate ratios for non-white uh, racial ethnic groups are much, much larger um, on the order of like between six and nine um, for non-Hispanic Blacks with the highest rate ratios being seen in this 35 to 44 year old range, similarly high for American Indians and Alaskan Natives, um, but also, and also Hispanic Latinos, um, but also elevated for Asian Pacific Islanders. So something dramatic is happening here where um, given infection at a younger age, the risk of dying seems to be much greater for non-white groups in these younger age categories. Uh, remembering that mortality, information on mortality, is incorporating information both on people's risk of being infected as well as their risk of dying given that they're infected. And so um, we think that this is being driven as much by differences in exposure because of um, the kinds of jobs that people are doing and their ability to socially distance, as well as, of course, pre-existing conditions um, that might influence the risk of death given infection in these age ranges. Now, it turns out that um, the CDC has recently released a data set, like this is within the last couple of weeks, I think, of monthly um, counts by age and race ethnicity. Um, it's actually by different regions of the United States, but this is just looking at the United States overall. And what I've done on the top line is to plot these on the log 10 scale because when you're looking at age specific rates, the rates in the younger ages are so much less than the rates in the older ages, it's very difficult to put them on the same plot. This gives you a sense though of what groups are experiencing much higher uh, rates of death over all of the ages. And what you can see looking along the top is that, um, so these uh, orange triangles are the non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaskan Native. And while this was the situation back in April that they were sort of somewhat lower than the um, Hispanic slash Latino or non-Hispanic Blacks, that the rates for that group really um, escalate over the summer. Um, and you can see that here plotted on the rate ratio scale um, in a very alarming way. Um, and so this I think does reflect what was happening in Navajo Nation. Um, over the summer. Um, but even taking that out of this picture, if you wanted to concentrate on what's happening for non-Hispanic Blacks and Latinos, you can see that they are particularly at the younger ages uh, experiencing much larger death rates compared to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, and that in fact, non-Hispanic whites and, and non-Hispanic Asians end up looking very similar. Uh, that being said, Asian Pacific Islander United States is a very diverse group itself. Um, and so this doesn't look at um, uh, categories within that, which we do think um, are important. I just read a news article came by this morning suggesting that um, uh, the, the, proportion of, the proportion of Filipinos working in nursing um, is like, I, I think around 4%, but the number, the proportion um, of Filipino nurses who have died since the beginning of the pandemic in the United States is much larger. And so um, that really speaks to the importance of looking within these categories. Finally, the last thing I want to point out about this is that over the summer, something seems to happen where the, um, risk, the rate ratio for uh, Latinos seems to increase more rapidly or go up higher than for non-Hispanic Blacks. So you see this separation of the blue line, which is the um, Hispanic line from the green line, 
which is the non-Hispanic black line. And that happened, uh, that peaked particularly in July, but seems to be persisting uh, as we go into August. All right, finally, um, in my last two minutes, I just want to um, talk about some analyses we've been recently working on um, that are looking at the trends in the case and death rates by the county social metrics. So the work that we looked at previously used these publicly available data, which are cumulative case and death counts, um, but really to get a sense of how the epidemic is evolving in the United States, it might make sense to look at uh, incidence and mortality rates over time. And we can do this by um, decumulating the uh, cumulative case and death counts that are available from public sources like USA Facts. So what we did is we took the USA Facts data, we decumulated it on a weekly basis by taking you know, the cumulative number of cases from this week, uh, subtracting the cumulative number of cases last week, and then using that as the count for this week. Um, this data, by the way, is not perfect. There, there are numerous data anomalies that happened in this data. We know that over time, there were changes in whether people were reporting confirmed versus confirmed and presumed cases. There's a particular notable day at the beginning of July when New Jersey adds like 2,000 cases um, to their accounts. So um, there are data anomalies in here. But we uh, match these to the um, county social metrics from the American Community Survey. Um, and then we calculated crude case and death rates uh, per 100,000 person years. And so this is a picture of um, poverty, cases on the left and deaths on the right. If you remember the plots that I showed earlier with respect to deaths, we saw that interesting pattern where the highest death rates were in the most impoverished counties, but that actually um, the least impoverished counties seen here in the dark blue line were lagging not too far behind and where some of the middle categories of poverty um, had the lowest rates. And we see that again here. And that we think again reflects the characteristics of counties in the Northeast that were affected in this first quote unquote phase of the pandemic. What you see here with this spike in the dark blue is the effect of New Jersey adding um, 2000 cases to their uh, deaths to their death counts um, in July. Um, and we see that it apparently affected the most affluent counties in New Jersey particularly. But what's interesting to us here is that as you enter this second phase, um, in late summer, this complicated socioeconomic pattern clears up and becomes a very clear socioeconomic gradient going from the lowest rates in the least impoverished counties to the highest rates in the most impoverished counties. And something similar can be seen um, for the case data as well. Um, this is the pattern by crowding, which if you remember from our earlier analyses, um, did show a clear socioeconomic gradient uh, or a clear gradient from least crowded to most crowded. And we see that both of these spikes do um, fit that pattern in terms of the yellow being on top and the dark blue being on the bottom. Um, this is the picture with respect to percent black population. Um, I'm just in the interest of time skipping ahead to an interesting picture by percent Hispanic population. Um, among in, in both cases and deaths, where the highest rates were seen in the second to highest category um, during the first phase in early spring, but then the highest rates are seen in the most uh, sort of Hispanic Latino areas in the later part. And we think, again, this reflects the racial ethnic composition of cities in the Northeast versus, for example, Arizona, Florida, places like that in this uh, late summer phase where um, we have some counties with very large percent Hispanics experiencing this dramatically increased um, risk of death. And this is similar to what we saw in the racial ethnic analyses just a moment ago. Um, and then this is uh, the pattern by population of color. Again, a clear picture of this excess risk in the most, uh, in the counties that are uh, with the highest concentration a population of color. And we see this pattern in deaths for the early part as well as the later phase. Uh, and we really see the gap between these, relatively speaking, um, being quite 
large, particularly with this yellow line pulling away, which really suggests that as we progress through the pandemic in the United States, social inequalities are increasing in terms of, we really see this in terms of who's able to continue to work from home, um, who is working in these jobs where as the economy opens, they're um, being exposed. And also I think the, the, um, the fact that, that the options for people um, for um, practicing isolation, if they think that they're exposed, protecting their families, taking sick time off from work, um, all of those things are affecting this increasing inequality that we see happening in this second phase. Um, and this is just to complete the picture um, by the index of concentration at the extremes. Again, we see this flip pattern where if you remember that U-shaped pattern that I described in the death analysis way back in May, um, we see that flip so that we get a much clearer gradient here with um, the most uh, disadvantaged areas having the highest rates and the most advantaged areas having the lowest rates in the late summer. So all of this is just to say um, that, uh, oops, there, um, that state and local health departments, we think really should continue to try to report these data by area-based social metrics in addition to what they're already doing in order to make these social inequalities visible. Um, the methods on our Public Health Disparities Geocoding Project website um, are available. Let me just actually go here to show you. We made a special page on our Public Health Disparities Geocoding Project website that includes some resources, our working papers. Um, there are also some data sets there where we've extracted the American Community Survey data for a number of social metrics for counties as well as zip codes so that anyone who wants to can link to these data. We also have our code up on the website um, if people want to replicate what we've done. And so one key thing is that, you know, again, we've tried to make the best uh, that we could out of really bad data or imperfect data. Um, and it is striking that we were able to see um, some really glaring evidence of inequalities um, and ones that we really need to address. But we could do so much better if the data were available stratified by age, if the racial ethnic data were made more complete on the state and local health department websites. One of the best uh, websites out there for tracking the availability of these data is the COVID tracking um, projects uh, racial data tracker. Um, and there we really see that on many of these public facing websites, um, the amount of data that are missing, particularly for cases, continues to be really high. Um, along with this lack of coordination um, in terms of data collection and surveillance, um, as we know, there's a lack of coordination around testing, around mitigation policy making. Um, but what we're seeing is that the effect of this is to really um, exacerbate existing inequalities in the United States. And what we're seeing is that communities who are already vulnerable are being made even more vulnerable. Um, and so the need to address this both in terms of the data, but also in terms of policy is really urgent. So I'm going to stop there um, and uh, turn things back over to the moderators um, for questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Chen, for that presentation. I think you build a pretty solid case for questioning our data, including assessing who and what is being recorded. So for the next 15 minutes, we'd like to take some questions from the audience. Um, we will try our best to accommodate as many questions as we can. Um, however, if your question does not get covered, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Chen directly. Um, remember that in order to submit a question, um, simply um, text your question to Emma via the chat function. All right, and we'll get started. I'm going to leave the screen share up in case you want me to go back to a slide. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, and again, great. also, just to say, I really apologize for the technical snafus at the beginning of the presentation. Today was an unusually bad technology day for me. No worries. We're just excited for this content. All right. 
So um, the first question that we have, um, how do you address um, underreporting selection by or selection bias, um, where individuals who are more marginalized are least likely to be reported, um, like in testing and hospitalization? Um, and what effect does this have on um, estimates? Yeah, so I mean, we've we've thought some about this, and uh, you know, given that what you propose is that it's individuals who are more disadvantaged who are less likely to be detected. Mm -hmm. We can well imagine that these um, trends that we've detected here may well be underestimates of the true um, right. disparities, right? Because if, if people in the most disadvantaged uh, areas or people in the most disadvantaged groups for the race ethnicity analysis are not being detected, their rates might be even higher. And so we may in fact have a conservative estimate here. Mm -hmm. um, I've been really interested in whether we could use data on testing, but see if we had better data on the race ethnicity of people getting tested, we might develop some measurement error correction models mm -hmm. to try to kind of estimate what might be happening um, in the people that we don't see. Um, but I think testing data is really, again, um, subject to a lot of missing data, I think because the options for getting tested are so varied and you know, I think what's happened, what was happening certainly early on is that you might go to a drive-through testing site. First of all, your ability to get in a car and drive to a drive-through testing site might be very socially patterned. But once right. you're there, I don't know whether they're, you know, you get, maybe you get a form to fill out, but you might not have who's enforcing whether you fill out all of the demographic data. Is the demographic data even on the form? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that those data that I would like to have to be able to do measurement error correction are probably not even there. That's a good point. Let's see, the next question um, kind of shifts more to that question of how the data is represented or how the data structures exist. Um, your work and that of other social, social epidemiologists has shown that failure to account for age structures obscures the disparate impact of COVID on racial and ethnic minorities. Um, a recent paper by our colleagues in population health sciences, um, a few uh, PhD candidates has also shown that um, data representation based on the racial ethnic um, distribution in counties and other geospatial locations specifically also changes the way these figures um, develop on the main stage. And so, are there other methodological pitfalls that epidemiologists should be aware of when um, reading COVID studies or actually um, doing these investigations? Mm -hmm. um, that's a really great question. And that, that work by the um, group of PHS um, students was really great in terms of casting some light on one of the reporting practices of the CDC, which was to report its racial ethnic disparities data in relation to the kind of proportion of cases and proportion of population where they were doing some adjustment for um, kind of downweighting counties where there weren't a lot of COVID cases. It basically changes the question of who is affected. Um, so what we've done here in an R analysis is to just look aggregating across the whole United States, including um, combining information on white folks in areas where there wasn't much COVID with information on areas where there was more COVID, which is where many of the people of color in the United States are living. And so that does really reflect the disparities in who is affected. What was happening with the weighting methodology that the CDC was using and as the, um, as the PHS group really showed very well in their paper was that was resulting in um, smaller estimates of the racial ethnic disparities because it had shifted the question really to the, to the question of, in the counties where COVID transmission was happening, what was the disparity um, between uh, non-white and white racial ethnic groups in those areas? That's a valid question. That's a reasonable question, but it's a different question than what's happening descriptively across the whole country and who is affected. Another really extreme example of this um, was a, a maybe a couple of months or a month ago, um, one of the CDC MMWR papers came out um, that did some analyses looking at counties um, in terms of the racial ethnic disparity um, and highlighted some counties where the Asian Pacific Islander disparity was really large. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I was contacted by a journalist um, who had a question about this. Um, and we realized that the those were counties where the disparity was large, but nothing was said about how large the population in the counties were. Mm. So the interpretation the journalist came up with was, was thinking, oh, these are the counties where all the Asian deaths occurred. But that wasn't what was being said. These were the counties where the disparity right. was large, but the number of deaths might have actually been quite small. And so these aggregation effects are really important um, to take into consideration. I think it just means we have to be really clear about what is the scientific question we're asking about who's affected overall in the United States versus mm -hmm. what is the disparity within a particular county. Something that I'm very interested in from the work that we've done in the past on modeling spatial variation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome, thanks for that. All right, our next question um, is related to um, one of your slides. And the question is, what is responsible for the disappearance of the U-shaped relationships between socioeconomic variables and cases per deaths during the second wave in late summer? Let's go right to the index of concentration at the extremes. So I think that what's happening here, if you think about New York City, this is what I always come back to is, New York City. So there are five boroughs in New York City. You've got like Manhattan, you've got Queens, um, the Bronx, Brooklyn, um, Staten Island, et cetera, right? And so particularly these, um, the areas where the ice variable is a very negative number, which is the more disadvantaged areas are particularly in like Queens, the Bronx, and to some extent Brooklyn. But you've got this extreme on the other side where you've got Manhattan. Where, um, where the ice is actually um, um, a higher uh, value that's sort of more dominated by these super rich populations, super white populations living in that particular borough. And the effect of that, because the population is really large, and then also like some of the outerlying areas in Long Island and New Jersey, um, those are what are contributing to the height of this dark blue line and that um, because the city was affected as a whole, both um, uh, sort of racially segregated populations, racially economically segregated populations were being affected as were um, people on the other side. And because these are aggregated over counties and dominated by some of these large counties, that's why you're seeing this pattern in the early phase. Um, and then you see this flip in the later phase as this moves into um, the south and into the southwest, um, where there's a lot more um, areas that are um, contributing um, in following these particular patterns of socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, that's my best sort of interpretation of what's going on here. And so again, this is where geography really matters. Um, you know, also, I guess, really important to say with respect to this idea of there being waves, I think there's been work out there, people have tried to look at this. And if you disaggregate these waves by geography, what you really see is that there's some areas that experienced their curve in the early part of the spring mm -hmm. and have remained consistently low, like New York, like Massachusetts. There are other areas that have experienced, didn't experience much in the earlier part of the spring and are now experiencing in the later summer. Mm -hmm. I think when we look across states, the only state that really fits this two wave pattern is Louisiana. There was an early outbreak in Louisiana, then there was a lull, and then there was a second phase in Louisiana. So what you're seeing here is, is sort of superimposed um, kind of ge geographic patterns um, as well. And I think that speaks to the importance of doing further work in the future to kind of chart this over time um, by geography. Indeed, indeed. So I'm familiar in the context of your presentations that you do an excellent job at framing the issues that um, are being presented. And so could you speak more to the dangers of science um, pointing out the existence of racial disparities without also exploring the causes of these disparities? Um, and how does um, a lack of data exacerbate this problem? So, you know, it's of course, without the data, we can't even really see 
that the um, the problems exist. Uh, and the fact that we went so long, you know, what's just to say that, um, you know, legislation is actually mandated um, that racial ethnic data be reported in COVID-19 data. And the you know, policy was announced by the Trump administration that that would be in effect by August the 1st. Um, and that is so not in effect by August the 1st. Like what oh. we see from the COVID racial data tracker is that, um, you know, there was very little movement in most states towards increased reporting, um, especially, I mean, for the cases, which is what it was mandated for. Um, deaths has improved somewhat, and I think part of that is because death certificates do require you to report race ethnicity. Um, so there is a real data problem. And as Dr. Krieger has sort of pointed out, we're sort of um, early on, we might have said, well, everyone was having trouble just getting their data systems up and running, and maybe everyone was swamped. I think we're now in the phase where um, we, this is not just benign neglect, but something um, insidious about like not um, really um, highlighting um, racial disparities and their importance here. Um, and so it really speaks to the need for um, advocacy on our part as researchers, as well as communities to get these data um, reported. But as you pointed out, the story can't end there. It can't just be about identifying groups at increased risk and putting our hands up in the air and saying, well, it's inevitable because of their comorbid conditions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that we look at that. And, and there has been some work and, and we've tried to do some things um, to look at the relative importance of risk of infection versus risk of death given infection. And so even if you just do back of the envelope calculations, um, looking at case rates and death rates, um, you really see that the disparities, particularly that we saw by age, in the risk of um, infection um, really are the driving force between these mortality, be uh, behind these mortality rates and really mm -hmm. speak to, again, who's working an essential job, who has paid sick leave time so that they can take time off if they get sick, who's living in conditions that enable them to socially isolate if they get infected, who's working multiple jobs where they're there because they're going from place to place, they have that much more risk of infecting a wider social network. I mean, these realities of how Americans work and live um, are really driving the patterns that we see here. Um, you know, an interesting um, thought exercise um, that I've gone through is to think about all the people in my social network who are able to work from home and to realize that I might not actually see many of the people in wider social networks who are not able to. So Americans live in these very segregated, very compartmentalized structures where we don't see the full impact um, this is that this is having, particularly mm -hmm. in disadvantaged communities. And so I think a really urgent thing for those of us who work in academia, who are able to work from home is to not take our eyes off this reality yeah. that Americans, um, the majority of Americans are being affected in ways that we might not see as clearly. And that's, that's again, why we need data science, why we need epidemiology, why we need social epidemiology um, and to improve these data. We need to make visible that which um, is not visible or which people actively try to ignore. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that call, Dr. Chen. Um, and on behalf of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience for tuning in to the second talk of the COVID and Health um, Inequities Seminar Series. We hope that you can join us at our next presentation next Thursday on October 8th, featuring Dr. Bibbins Domingo from UCSF. Um, she'll be talking on the tale of two Californias. Averages are no consolation to those who have been left behind. Sounds exciting. So we hope to see you there and we thank each of you for coming and participating. Enjoy the rest of your week.